Shigella flexneri is a bacteria that causes a severe diarrheal disease known as bacillary dysentery. It's transmitted fecal orally by a very low infectious dose. In fact, it only takes 10 bacteria to cause the disease. Shigella flexneri causes a huge disease burden. In developing nations, over 750,000 children under the age of five die per year. And of the causes of that diarrheal disease, Shigella is in the top four agents. Because of the low infectious dose, it's really common in areas where hygiene is compromised and where people are highly mobile. And this includes displaced populations, as well as war zones. The disease caused by Shigella flexneri is bacterial in origin, which means we can treat it using antibiotics. But like so many other diseases today, Shigella flexneri is becoming resistant against antibiotics, including some of our last line antibiotics. For that reason, it would be ideal to have a vaccine to prevent Shigella, but unfortunately, no licensed vaccine for Shigella exists. In order to understand bacteria so that we can control these diseases, we need to know as much about the bacteria as possible. One of the ways we can do this is by doing complete genome sequencing of bacteria, reading every letter of its DNA. Normally when we sequence a bacterial genome, we shred it into sections and we try and put it back together like a jigsaw. With Shigella though, throughout their genome they have hundreds of repeated elements, so when we try to put the jigsaw back together, it's not obvious how we reconstruct the genome. Understanding these repeat elements in Shigella is actually a really important part of their evolution because it's what allows them to exchange DNA with other bacteria. So in this way, they can acquire new genetic information, such as antimicrobial resistance characteristics. So because it's so important to study those repeat elements, we had to use newer long read technology that covered the repeat elements in order to be able to reconstruct the genome. Now that we have this new technology, it's relatively easy to sequence Shigella flexneri genomes. But like so many things in science, it's actually differences, it's comparisons that give us information. And for studying this disease, we wanted to study its evolution over time, so we needed multiple genomes snapshotted in time. When we study bacterial genomes, often what we use are large data sets that are collected over a long period of time and often from many different places as well. In this study, we only had four complete Shigella genomes to work with. Now luckily, these genomes were from a variety of time points and they covered a long time period. The earliest available isolate of Shigella flexneri was actually taken from a soldier in World War I who had dysentery. And actually, that isolate started the National Collection of Type Cultures, the longest running collection of human pathogenic bacteria in the world. The National Collection of Type Cultures was set up in 1920 because scientists recognised there was a need for characterised bacterial cultures that could be shared throughout the scientific community. They are a combination of historical strains and modern strains, and those strains can provide information about microbial evolution, for example. They're also useful as control strains so that you can have continuity between diagnostic tests undertaken in different laboratories, perhaps across the world. As well as being a scientist, I'm really interested in genealogy and history. We knew that one of the earliest samples submitted to the National Collection of Type Cultures was a Shigella flexneri bacterium, believed to be one of the first cases of dysentery from World War I. Being that 2014 marks 100 years since the start of the First World War, it also gave us the opportunity to commemorate those who fought and to highlight the burden of infectious disease during this time. The sample's reference was Cable, and based on other sample names in the collection, we thought it likely that Cable was the surname of the person from whom the sample was taken. I became rather fascinated by Cable and wanted to find out more about him. What conditions did he have to deal with? And did he survive the disease that had given us our sample? My search began in the National Archives, looking through the British Army Medal Index Cards. They record the medals that men and women who served in the First World War are entitled to claim. Like the genetic code of the bacterium we were studying, I quickly discovered there were a lot of repeats of the name Cable, almost 300. If I was ever to find Cable, it was clear that I needed a way to narrow down my search. Going back to the catalogue, listing the samples in the National Collection of Type Cultures, I decided to focus instead on the name of the person who isolated the sample, Broughton Alcock. 
Lieutenant William Broughton Alcock was a bacteriologist during World War I, assigned to Number 14 Stationary Hospital in France. Originally a seaside hotel, the building that became Number 14 Stationary Hospital during World War I still exists today. Even though World War I is known as the first conflict where more soldiers died from hostile action than from infectious disease, infection still plays a huge burden on military personnel. The day that William Broughton and Alcock arrived for duty, Number 14 Stationary Hospital was reassigned to deal solely with infectious cases. The trenches nearby were no place to be ill. For Cable, it must have been some relief to be moved to this hospital, where he could receive specialist care. However, under pressure from the increasing number of patients coming from the front, this infectious hospital was fighting a daily battle of its own. Under such pressure, hospitals like this one were forced to quickly adopt methods to control the spread of infection. As well as basic hygienic measures, Primitive Pasteur-type vaccines were being used for typhoid and cholera, but then, just as now, there is no effective vaccine for Shigella. Daily hospital records and diaries from staff give us a vivid picture of the challenges faced when treating soldiers such as Capel. 1st of December, 1914, Boulogne. In the morning, visited 14 stationary hospitals. Terex have increased in number, and the whole of the ground floor of this hospital is set apart for them. The hospital entries also listed the numbers of patients admitted and discharged and kept a record of patients who died. Here, I eventually found an entry on the 13th of March, 1915. Sadly, Private Ernest Cable of the 2nd Battalion of the East Area Regiment died from his infection here in France and never returned home. Ernest Cable is buried here high on a hill in Vimeo Communal Cemetery, among 3,000 of his fellow soldiers. The simple stone that commemorates him reveals little about the man behind the soldier. Back in England, I could find no recorded family, except for an online dedication from a Michael Norman. Perhaps now, we could finally put a face to the name Ernest Cable. So Michael, what's your connection with Ernest Cable? Well, it all started really, it goes back to my grandparents and uh, where I used to live. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, Ernest Cable had um, joined up and was in First World War, so that's not somebody I knew, but my father knew him and my father would have been about five or six at the time. And in the family, it was understood that uh, Ernest uh, didn't have anywhere to stay. So my grandfather offered him a bed and uh, he stayed there, but I don't know how long for. And then he went off to the war. And uh, the next thing that I knew was that um, my grandmother had received the death penny Everybody who died or was killed, uh, they received that. It was always on the mantelpiece. It was always well polished, which is why it's worn away. I used to play with it as a ch child, actually, because I didn't know what it was. And so that's how Ernest Cable came into our family. So what made you post the, um, you know, the notice on the World War One commemorative website? I came across this um, website that talked about dedication, and it seemed that people were putting on dedications to perhaps family members or been in the First World War. So thinking that nobody knows Ernest Cable, because the best I knowledge there was no family about, I thought, well, I'll just write a little story. And that's why that little paragraph appeared in that website. And I think it's really nice, actually, because now a lot more people know about him. Yes, unfortunately, we don't have a photograph or anything. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's possible to get hold of. I don't think the army took photographs, really. Although we couldn't find a photograph of Private Ernest Cable, the sample he gave us leaves a very clear image of the bacterium that killed him. When we compare Ernest Cable's strain to modern Shigella flexneri strains of the same lineage, we see that it's actually remarkably similar. 
Over 98% of the genes in NCTC1 are conserved in isolates up until 2002. But the changes that we do see tell a story of the evolution of Shigella. In the 100 years since World War I, this genome lineage has also acquired new genetic information. When we look at the function of that new genetic information, it relates almost exclusively to virulence and increasing antimicrobial resistance, which really just shows us how Shigella has continued to evolve against our efforts to control it. By using Ernest Cable's isolate of Shigella as a historical backdrop to study the evolution of the pathogen, and taking what we know of dysentery during World War I, we can actually gain insight to Shigella today. During World War I, the poor sanitary conditions and malnutrition in the troops predisposed them to these uncontrollable outbreaks. And it's those same factors that determine the distribution of Shigella today as a disease of children in developing nations. In 1915, antibiotics weren't available to treat Ernest Cable. And today, as Shigella is becoming increasingly resistant to antibiotics, we're fast running out of treatment options. What this means is that developing a licensed vaccine could be our best bet in this ongoing battle.